A father who wants no other parent in Colorado to go through what his family has endured. The shootings just keep happening. Perpetrators keep planning them. Families keep going to court hearings and trials. John Castillo makes his plea for concealed handguns on school grounds. Colorado's lieutenant governor says we were naive to trust hospitals in the past. A new report is suggesting they've been cashing in big time on your hospital visits. Big surprise there. And Denver wasn't always against urban camping. At one point, it was actually encouraged. Some random Colorado history for you. Next. So you won't find this on the calendar, but it's actually an annual event. Republican lawmakers push to ease gun restrictions in Colorado, and then the Democrats in the majority vote the bills down. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger is at the Capitol. Marshall, there was a slight difference this year. Instead of a family member who lost a loved one to gun violence asking for more gun control, we heard from a parent who actually wants more guns in school. Jeremy John Castillo is an outlier. His son Kendrick was killed at Stem Highlands Ranch back in May. He testified in favor of a bill to allow concealed carry of guns on school grounds. It's a bill that for the sixth straight year died in the first committee it was heard in. Castillo has become a fixture here at the Capitol. Uh, he supports school yeah, staff being board. armed, not necessarily teachers. There was a security team. guard at STEM when the shooting happened in May. The guard was armed even though the school didn't know that. Unlike other victims of gun violence testifying for strict gun laws in the state, Castillo made the case that his son could have been saved with some wiggle room. Kendrick was proud to be from Colorado. But we have a black eye on our state when it comes to domestic terror and school violence. You know, six years we've been waiting with a bill like this, and we need to do things that are different. Seventy percent of our schools are in rural areas. My God, think of that. We had a substation two blocks away at STEM, and look at how many people were shot, and they still couldn't get to my son. As it has every year, that bill died on a party line vote. This year it was six Democrats in the committee voting against it, three Republicans supporting it. And just five minutes ago, the second of two gun bills died in the same committee. This would have been to repeal the uh, large capacity magazine ban that we highlighted in an investigation in November that they are still available through parts kits and some gun stores selling them as though the law doesn't exist at all. Again, on a six to three party line vote, the repeal of that law failed. Uh, Jeremy, there is a rule that every bill has its stay in front of a committee. There is not a rule that those bills need any help from year to year to getting any more advanced than the year before. Which is why we see this happening every year. Thank you, uh, Marshall. A young woman who threatened gun violence, prompting the shutdown of schools all across the front range last year, was able to buy a shotgun here in Colorado. Congressman Joe Nagu says his call for an investigation into that purchase is being answered. You'll remember how big of a deal this was. About half a million kids stayed home as the FBI hunt for Seoul Pais shut down schools for a day in April. Pais was not old enough to buy a shotgun in her home state of Florida, but she was able to get one here in Colorado at age 18 just after landing in Denver. Gun sellers are supposed to follow the rules in a buyer's resident state. Pais was later found dead after taking her own life near Mount Evans. The inspector general for the Department of Justice says they will run an audit to figure out how this happened. In the world of health care costs, this next story is a big deal. It's about money. Today, Governor Jared Polis' office put hospitals all over the state on notice, saying, in essence, we think... Your hospital profits are hurting patients. The notice came in the form of a lengthy report outlining a big hike in hospital revenues. Here's Chris Vanderveen with more. There's no business like the health care business, and in Colorado, that business is booming. A state report out Thursday suggests between 2009 and 2018, hospital profits jumped 280 percent. Choosing to raise prices when the profits and financials would show that it was unnecessary to continue to raise those prices. The state, specifically the governor's office, wouldn't bite when I asked if this was indicative of greed. But one of the leaders in the office on the issue would at least tell us this. So we invite CEOs of hospitals and boards to start recognizing how they can be a better part of the solution and changing their focus. In 2009, the report says Colorado's hospital average profit per patient was $538. 
In 2018, $1,518. <laughs> Pamela White last year spent more on her health care per month than she did on her mortgage. And she, a cancer survivor, has insurance. A friend of mine uh, equated American health care to a stick up, where somebody says basically your money or your life. And when you're diagnosed with cancer, you have to do what you have to do. The Colorado Hospital Association called the study's numbers highly inflated as they do not take into account many expenses, such as taxes and training. Adding, hospitals have been good partners in addressing costs with the Polis administration. Look for legislators to cite this study often when trying to come up with ways to bring down health care costs this year. For next, I'm Chris Vandermeer. Denver police say they are once again enforcing the city's unauthorized camping ordinance. It's been a week since the city of Denver cleared out a large homeless camp just feet away from the state capitol. It's a temporary fix for a permanent problem. Today, Mayor Michael Hancock repeated his argument that repealing the city's camping ban is not the answer. I've been very clear with regards to the camping ban uh, on my position. I don't find it humane to encourage people to sleep outdoors. As you saw in our Civic Center Park and at Veterans Park, it can become a very inhumane, very unsafe and unsanitary situation very quickly. And that's why we moved in on the, under a public health uh, uh, crisis to abate the issue uh, and again try to provide services to those individuals who were trying to camp outdoors. Right now, Mayor Hancock is at a national conference for mayors across the country. He says the issue of homelessness is one they are heavily focusing on. They're bouncing ideas off each other to hopefully find better ways to address the problem. There was once a time Denver actually encouraged camping in the city parks, which brings us to our random Colorado history segment. Yes, this is true. More than 100 years ago, city officials wanted more tourists to stay in the city, so they encouraged free camping at city park. Our friends at the Denver Public Library have a fascinating write-up about this. It says back in 1914, when this thing called the automobile changed tourism across the country, Denver rushed at the chance to get people to stick around here. An urban camping program was started. Anybody could stop at City Park, pitch a tent, and then camp. The trend became so popular, the city had to expand the program to accommodate thousands of tourists over the following years. Of course, today, things are quite different. You can read more about that program on the next Facebook page. If someone tries to tell you Colorado is equal parts Republican, Democrat, and unaffiliated, you tell them you watch next and they're living in the past. Colorado is now 40% unaffiliated, 30% Democrat, and 29% Republican. These are based on the most recent voter registration numbers in Colorado. Last year, from January until Election Day, the state registered more than 100,000 new unaffiliated voters, according to Magellan Strategies, a conservative, a conservative leading polling firm in Louisville. Three times as many as Democrats and Republicans. But the head of Magellan reminds us unaffiliated does not mean up for grabs. Our work internally, we have found that it does lean more Democratic than Republican. Um, but in this political environment, to be very honest with you, there are very few, uh, I would say, voters that consider candidates of both parties equally. Uh, the persuadable voter universe has really dropped from about 18 percent down to about 10 percent. Starting in April, this is interesting, new voters will automatically be registered to vote when they go get a driver's license. They'll be registered as unaffiliated then be mailed an option to register with a specific party. It's an extra step that is likely to inflate unaffiliated voter numbers. Here's your daily impeachment update. Not much activity from Colorado lawmakers so far during today's proceedings. Colorado Senator Michael Bennett had a lot to say this morning before things began. It's the first we've heard from him since the impeachment trial started uh, during a started during a conference call with media. We asked him at at this point, how he'd vote on both charges. I, I think that a compelling case is being put in front of the Senate, uh, and so far it hasn't been rebutted at all by the, uh, um, except by the president's middle finger. Uh, so um, we will see. 
And so far, we haven't heard anything from Republican Senator Cory Gardner or Democratic Representative Jason Crow. Crow is one of the managers during the impeachment for Democrats. The ride is over. Denver B-Cycle is slowly removing its bikes and docks around the city. So we wanted to know what's going to happen with all of that stuff. A lot of people seem to think we can't do as much as we can. Reading and writing in Braille. Students show us their special skill as they get ready for a unique competition in Los Angeles. today, but still the views were spectacular early this morning for that sunrise. Bill Infield capturing this one from Castle Rock, looking off toward Pikes Peak. Wow, what a shot. Meanwhile, up in the high country, they're getting excited about snow. So much snowfall, a eh, basin packing on all of the powder and more to come as we head toward the weekend. High pressure is around for now here in Colorado, so we're watching those snow showers that have been pushing through the high country, winding down late tonight into early tomorrow. We'll get a brief break before another storm system that's pushing in across the Pacific Northwest moves in by late tomorrow evening. Tonight, mostly clear. We'll be just tracking a couple of clouds out there as temperatures fall to about 23. We'll stay in the 20s along the plains with teens mainly up in the mountains. So here we go. We're watching that next storm, the cold front associated with it. Plow right on into the state. So heavy snowfall if you are heading up I-70 tomorrow late in the evening into early Saturday morning. Right now it looks like several inches of snowfall will be stacking up. So that'll be nice to see a great start to the weekend. Great start to your Friday with plenty of sunshine. It's looking really good as the afternoon rolls on. Here comes the cloud deck first with a little bit of snowfall up in the mountains. It really becomes widespread by later tomorrow evening, 10, 11 o'clock for our northern and central mountains right there across the mountain corridor. Tomorrow temperatures here in the metro area will be a bit warmer. 54, running about 10 degrees above our average. 50s off to the plains with 20s and 30s still up in the high country as they're awaiting this next system. Hey, the weekend looks fantastic. Close to 60 degrees on Sunday. Right now it does look like another storm system pushes in Jeremy Monday into Tuesday. Fingers crossed we see our first snowfall of January. We still haven't seen any just yet. Yeah, where's the snow been this month? <laughs> I know, we need it. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. Mm -hmm. The most Colorado thing we saw today. Here is one way to celebrate a successful hike in the middle of winter. Andrew sent us this video on Twitter of him sliding down the mountainside on his stomach. He says he was channeling his inner penguin. He and some friends hiked to Lake Agnes near Cameron Pass earlier this month. We're just glad that lake ice here is thick enough. <laughs> on Monday, we brought you an ode to B-Cycle Denver from people who said they were going to miss the bike sharing system. It ends operations in Denver later this month. We've been wondering what's going to happen to all of the bikes and docks that the company is taking down. We asked Denver Bike Sharing, which runs Denver B-Cycle. Executive Director Mike Pletch says they're still trying to work out a concrete plan so all of the bikes get a new home. Their goal is to sell or donate all of that equipment. B-Cycle actually operates in 30 other cities, including in Boulder. If they can't sell or donate that stuff, then they'll have to scrap it, which is something that they don't want to do. So where are they storing all of those bikes? Apparently at their offices at 2737 Larimer, and it's been turned into this makeshift storage facility that includes keeping some of their bikes in their garage as well as in between their cubicles and desks. It's a little like their AFC championship with a chance to go to the Super Bowl. It just sounds like a lot of very loud, kind, almost typewriter sounds. We talked to some of the students participating in a very unique kind of competition. And it's a sign that Colorado landlords seem to be getting more creative with rental properties. open. <laughs> 22 students from across Colorado competed against each other today for a chance to head to Los Angeles this summer. It's a unique competition. 
reading and writing in Braille. Nine News photojournalist Corky Scholl went to the Colorado Center for the Blind to check it out. Okay, I'm going to start the timer for 25 minutes, and I'll tell you when to start. All right, are you ready? This is a competition known as the Braille Challenge. Basically what that is, is where people who are blind or low vision compete in a bunch of competitions involving Braille. It just sounds like a lot of very loud, kind, almost typewriter sounds. Me personally, I've been doing the Braille Challenge for about, oh, like seven to eight years. A lot of people seem to think we can't do as much as we can, and Braille really opens up a lot of opportunities for that. Braille is kind of an important aspect of, of how a blind person lives his or her life. Pretty much, yeah, because otherwise I wouldn't really be able to read or do a lot of things that I can. And so having Braille under your fingertips and being able to tell exactly which letters form a word and what is this punctuation used for and how does this word fit with that word. You know, that, that's, that's literacy right there. That, that's really what we need for our students to be successful in high school, in college, and, you know, into adulthood. And it kind of changes the life of a blind person for the better. I mean, it's how I read and write. Basically, my message is blind people have a whole array of opportunities. They just have to put their mind to it. Great job. Was, you guys were fast. Ah, that was that was fun. Yeah. It's a sign that rental properties are a hot commodity in Colorado and just about anything can be turned into apartments. Next. It's just another sign landlords are looking for gold in Colorado, maybe. Our viewer Chuck took this picture. A for rent sign outside an abandoned mine on Four Mile Canyon Road in Boulder County. Chuck says he knew rentals were scarce, but even this surprised him. So we got to know what signs made you laugh today. Send us pictures to next at 9news.com or tweet them with the hashtag HeyNext. I like this next story here. This is good. This is funny. Speaking of signs. This photo is a pretty good indicator that the fake coyote set up outside of Legacy High School isn't really doing its job very well. A teacher at the school in Broomfield took this photo of a flock of geese crowding around the exact thing that is supposed to be scaring them off in the, in the first place. I guess it's a, you know, it's a tough crowd here and he's clearly outnumbered, so we won't give that uh, coyote too much goose grief. Let's talk about some viewer feedback here. Uh, Kate says, love the political party graphic with the unaffiliated platypus uh, symbol. I dig that too. Um, Kelly says, I'm in Brighton eating green chili. Should I dive into the Pueblo versus New Mexico green chili debate? Ah, we don't have time for that. I only got like 10 more seconds. And Shirley says, looking great, new dad. We love you when you host. I'll be back manana.